Bobby Petito case, her fiance, Brian Laundrie, is officially a wanted man, but not for the crime you'd think. We have assembled an all-star panel on the twists and turns and all the new theories on where he's hiding and how Gabby Petito was killed on a very special episode of Banfield. Welcome to Banfield. We've got major breaking news in the Gabby Petito homicide investigation. An arrest warrant has now been issued nationwide. Federal arrest for Brian Laundrie, the fiance on the run. But surprisingly, the feds want him for bank fraud. I'll get to that. The warrant accuses Laundrie of using someone else's debit card and PIN between August 30th and September 1st. And if you've been following this case, you know darn sure why September 1st is important. It is the day that a license plate reader caught that infamous white van returning to Northport, Florida, presumably driven by one Brian Laundry, And it doesn't take a lot of head scratching to figure out whose debit card he may have been using on that trip. After all, he knew the pin, so he had to be pretty darn close to the debit card's owner. All of this just hours after Brian Laundry, his parents, left their home in Northport this morning. Take a look at the pictures. There they go, 8.15 a.m., and guess where they were headed? Towards the general vicinity of the Northport Police Station. And a short time later, Brian Laundrie's parents came home. But following them, a police car and an FBI vehicle behind them. Right after that, they jumped right back into that red pickup truck and they drove off to Orlando. That's where they met with their lawyer. News Nation's Brian Enton was at the house trying to get them to answer the questions every one of us now has. Mr. Laundry, where's your son? What is your Do you know anything about where Gabby, what happened to Gabby Petito? Why aren't you talking? Why aren't you out looking for your son? The reporter who asked those questions is with me now, News Nation's Brian Enton, who has been on stakeout for weeks now. Brian, a lot of major developments. Um, it is just shocking to see the movements with those parents all within the timeline that Brian Enton is now a wanted man across the country. Do we have any indication what those parents did when they drove off towards the police station? We do, actually. We confirmed with their attorney from New York, Mr. Bertolino, that they got in this red pickup truck. They drove to Orlando. They met with Mr. Bertolino, who landed there uh, from New York, where he lives. They had a meeting, uh, and then the parents drove back here to the house, uh, and that's when I was able to yell those questions at them. But at the same time, do we know if they actually talked to the police just before that federal arrest warrant came out of Denver? We don't. What we know is this morning, uh, around 9 a.m., both of the parents got in the truck. They left here for a very short time. It wasn't a long time. Uh, and then the dad came back driving the truck, and the mom came back driving the silver Mustang. So we assume uh, that the police released the silver Mustang. They were done processing it, and they called the parents and said, come pick it up and bring it back. It doesn't appear that they actually interviewed the parents. I don't think it was enough time. So any expectations on what the laundries are up to tonight after such a busy day? Usually it's pretty dark behind you in that home. Usually they keep a really low profile. What do we know of them tonight? It's been quiet tonight. I mean, we're outside the house now. It's like the other nights we've talked to you, Ashley. It's pretty dark, uh, not much going on. You know, it, it was interesting when I was shouting those questions at them, just the way they sort of calmly got out of the van as if it was like any other day. The mom had a little uh, cooler, which got a lot of attention. People wondering what was in that cooler. I don't know if she brought her lunch or whatever, but she had a little cooler. They got out and they just went into the house. Um, so that's where they remain tonight, Ashley. Brian Enton is on the watch for us in front of that now brand new camper top, the neighbors say, that just appeared on the scene on the day.
that Gabby Petito was uh, was actually um, listed as missing. Yeah, that's when the camper was purchased, and off they went on a trip with their 23-year-old son in a very small camper. We've got so many developments. Fortunately, we've got the best legal and journalistic minds in the business who are joining us tonight. She is the host of America's Most Wanted, and she's also an award-winning journalist. It's Elizabeth Vargas who is with us. Also, Steve Helling is the senior writer for People magazine. He's got the cover of this week's issue. It's his investigation into Gabby's uh, relationship volatile relationship with Brian as witnessed by friends of both of them. Jim Murray is the chief correspondent for Inside Edition and Mark O'Mara is a civil rights and criminal defense attorney who represented George Zimmerman so he knows a thing or two about representing someone who a lot of people do not like. Elizabeth Vargas, I want to begin with you. This is your lifeblood, America's most wanted and now we officially have a man who is wanted across America? Are you surprised that it took this long to get an arrest warrant? Very surprised, actually, Ashley. It's, I think, everybody watching this case and following this case, and there are millions and millions of people, as we can see, who are doing just that, are really surprised that it took this long. Uh, from the very start, there have been very, very big questions. Why was he, you know, how did he come home? Where was she? Why wasn't anybody asking him those questions for those 10 days? that he was home in his parents' house in Florida without Gabby. Uh, and, and clearly nobody else was with her. We know that she, there was that you know, Moab police uh, stop and the body cam footage. There are so many things that make him look extremely guilty um, and, and clearly responsible in some way. If he didn't kill her, then he left her someplace where she was killed by somebody else, perhaps, because it has been ruled a homicide. It's very, very surprising it's taken this long for a federal arrest warrant to be issued. But now at least uh, any police agency anywhere in the United States, if they see him, can now arrest him and incarcerate him immediately. Yeah, it can be very quick, and there are a lot of eyes out there. Steve Helling, I was so surprised to see bank fraud, and I think those who were following this case thought that mm -hmm. the first charge that would be announced would be for murder. But the real story here is that she has not been declared murdered. She's, it's a homicide. That's not necessarily mm -hmm. a murder. There are plenty of legal homicides out there. It is bank fraud. So walk me through what is so significant about the use of a bank card in those dates. Well, you know, what we know is that uh, Gabby's phone was powered off on the 27th of August, and he arrived back home in Florida on the 1st of September. So we had a few days there. And th during those few days, you know, that's how long it would take to drive from Utah to Florida. So, you know, he had to have been traveling during that time. And if Gabby, now we know, was left, you know, actually in Wyoming, then, you know, we're basically looking at all this time that he's driving by himself without Gabby using somebody else's uh, debit card. No, we don't know whose it is. I mean, we can guess exactly what we're talking about. But yeah, it's very significant because those are the days between when Gabby went missing and when he showed back up in Florida. Jim Ray, I'm going to ask you about that in a moment, but I also just want to remind everyone that Steve Helling's got the cover story, so he has been following this case for weeks, and he has met friends of both Gabby and Brian's who went to high school with both of them as they began their relationship. That is his cover story, and wait until you hear what Steve has to say about the way these two began dating and how volatile it was. In the meantime, Jim Ray. If you were a thinking man, uh, it's not hard to assume that you can't just use anyone's debit card. You can't steal it off a restaurant table. You have to know the pin. And so if it becomes known, and I'm not saying it is, it's an accusation that many are making, that he was using her debit card to travel back to Northport, it is salt in the wound of an already horrific case. It is, and it, you know, look, it, we're guessing, we're, we're speculating that this was Gabby Petito's bank card, but it's a fairly easy, uh, it's an easy assumption to make. Let's face it, they're engaged to be married. They're very close. They're traveling for months together. It's not uncommon for couples to share their PIN, uh, pin information with each other. The, the important thing really here is that authorities at this point clearly don't believe they have enough evidence to charge him with murder. 
but they do want to talk to him. The easiest way to do that is get out a warrant. What's the best warrant at this point? Bank fraud, because he's using a card that he's not allowed to use. It's an unauthorized use of somebody's debit card. So that really makes sense if you think about it. And it is damning, and it is incriminating, and we're all dancing around whose bank card it was. But I think we all have a good guess as who it was. Yeah, and Mark O'Mara, he's driving a now dead woman's van and never once saying how he came into possession of a dead woman's van. For me, that's probable cause a million hours ago. But can you tell me why they didn't immediately issue? I've seen arrest warrants issued for far less, with far less evidence and far less probable cause than that. I think this is a excellent move by very good federal prosecutors. They are not going to rush to judgment. They're not going to rush their case. So what they do, they're still building their case for homicide and trying to build it to a murder case against him. We know that that's what they're looking at. But what's the best way to get somebody to get out there to look for him? It, they, he basically gave them the option to get him arrested because he did use the card of a now person who we know is, is passed. And basically, this is a great move by the prosecution to get a warrant out there, not to charge him with murder yet, because don't forget, when you charge him with murder, the clock starts running on what we call the speedy trial rule. He's got to be tried within six months unless there's exceptions and continuances. So why charge him early with the murder case when you accomplish the same exact thing with the bank fraud charge? You get a federal warrant out there. When he is found, if he is found alive, he will be arrested, he will be detained. They will probably detain him well beyond the bank fraud charges because of the pending homicide investigation. And they've accomplished everything without showing their hands on the murder case and without getting that clock running. This is a perfect move by a good uh, prosecution team. It's really bright because Lori Vallow was another case where they had just, you know, waited and waited and waited. They yeah. didn't have to charge her they, with murder. They just got her on something else and held her and then collected all the evidence and started that clock ticking on a murder charge. So brilliant lawyering and brilliant thinking on the Fed's part. Elizabeth Vargas, we were just showing something called Route 1. I want to pop those, uh, those graphics back up because if Brian Laundrie drove back, uh, you know, across the U.S. from Wyoming to Florida, and he put in a GPS or a Google Maps, how do I get home the quickest way? There are three different ways that he could go. This one is Route 1, and it takes you through a number of states, but there's also Route 2 and Route 3. And the reason that's important for someone like you, who's, you know, America's most wanted, is that all of those people who live in the various states, and let's cycle through to Route 2 and Route 3, so that our viewers can see how many states are affected by this journey. That means that there could be a lot of tips for someone like you, Elizabeth, in your program, and for the FBI. It just means that millions and millions of people potentially could have seen Brian Laundrie's journey. Brian Laundrie was someplace for many, many days after Gabby Petito died. Uh, coming into contact with people, no matter how hard you try, you are going to be seen. We already have seen this. The YouTubers who spotted his van uh, in Wyoming, and that led to the discovery of Gabby Petito's body. We are seeing all sorts of people who are coming out of the woodwork. This, is, this case is unbelievable. I mean, the, the numbers on this, according to Axios, for example, hashtag Gabby Petito was seen 500 million times on TikTok by Monday night of this week. So this has captured huge interest. And anybody could have seen something. Not everybody's watching the news, but everybody is now on social media and starting to tune into this case if they haven't already. Millions of people already have. But somebody saw something. And what we found out on America's Most Wanted and other programs like it is that people really do want to do the right thing. They really do want to help. You've seen that in the flood of tips that have come into hotlines already and into law enforcement already. Many of them aren't good. Many of them might be the wrong person. We saw an image of a man, for example, in the Florida preserve that for a couple of days people wondered it was a blurry image. Could that be him? It now has been ruled that it wasn't him. But you should call in that information. People do want to help. And you will be seen by, we are not, this is not the moon. We're here in the United States of America and even in rural isolated areas, other people are driving by. Other people are in the gas station where he's got to stop and get more fuel for that, for that pickup truck or that 
camper as he's driving all the way back to Florida. Somebody saw him. He had to stop. He had to get gas. He had to get food. He used a restroom. Somebody saw him. And all it takes is one of those people calling in. And people do, Ashley. They really do. We saw it on our program. In just five weeks, we caught four fugitives. People call in. Oh, and by the way, Sabrina Delmonico, our crack producer, has just updated those numbers. It's over 900 million people or hits now on the Gabby Petito hashtag on TikTok. Right. 900 million. Right, I mean, that was Monday night, is, as I said. It's huge, whew. huge. 900. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just it's flying. Um, and and by the way, on that journey, anybody who may be helping them along the way could be harboring a fugitive. So watch your six if you think it's. It's a good idea to help Brian Laundry with pizza or money or a place to sleep or any of the, the uh, above. Okay, so when we come back after the break, I want to keep all four of you. I've got a lot more to talk about. Um, this story about Gabby and Brian first getting together in high school and what the kids said about their relationship. Volatile? That doesn't even begin to tell the story. It's People Magazine's cover story. Steve Helling is the author. He's going to describe for you what he has heard about this couple and how on and off and the peaks and valleys that relationship was. That's straight ahead. Welcome back to our special coverage of the Gabby Petito homicide investigation. An arrest warrant for bank fraud has officially been issued nationwide. It's a federal charge. So everyone across the country is now looking officially for fiance Brian Laundrie. And that means any police officer anywhere can collar that man if they can find him. We have an all-star legal panel with us discussing all of the late breaking news. Mark O'Mara is a criminal defense attorney and civil rights attorney. Jim Murray is the chief correspondent for Inside Edition. Steve Helling is a senior writer for People Magazine. The cover of this week's issue is his investigation into the Gabby Petito case. And Elizabeth Vargas is an award-winning journalist and the host of America's Most Wanted. Uh, Steve Helling, I could not believe some of the things that you discovered when you found some former classmates of both Gabby and Brian. Tell me what they told you about this couple. Well, you know, Gabby and Brian got together when she was a sophomore and he was a junior. And, you know, they have this on again, off again relationship, even through high school. Uh, you know, and it's kind of the young love that's immature, that's very volatile. You know, one minute they'd be like, oh, we're so in love. The next minute they'd be like, we're fighting. And they just did that again and again. It was the cycle that they did. And then they'd go with somebody else and they'd get back together. And so friends said that they never knew from one day to the next, are Gabby and Brian together or are they not? Uh, but nobody ever saw the uh, warning signs that there was any sort of abusive things going on. It was just drama. But the drama carried on in t after high school. And then, you know, eventually when um, Brian suggested to Gabby that, you know, she moves in with him and, and that they go travel the country, you know, her family was not happy. Her family wasn't happy with any of this, but you know, what are they gonna do? At that point, she was a grown up. So, you know, it's, it was one of those couples that got together very young and stayed together after high school. You know, most people break up with their high school sweetheart. That's not what happened here. And it just kind of kept going and going, but the drama never stopped. Well, this is a great story that you got. It's the cover story, as I mentioned. It's on newsstands tomorrow. Um, but I want to just sort of follow up on that, Steve Helling, because as you said, they were volatile in high school. If I did the math, she met him when she was a sophomore. That means she's been with him for seven years before August 12th. And I say August 12th mm -hmm. because that is when a witness called 911 in Moab, Utah, and said, I just witnessed a domestic assault. We've all seen bits of the body cam, but our producers have now put it all together as best we can so you can really get a feel for what happened in the desert in Moab. I want to play that for you right now. Take a look. I don't know. I don't know. We didn't invite him one morning, and, and he wouldn't let me in the car before. And then Why wouldn't he let you in the car? Because you have your OCD? He told me I need to calm down. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm perfectly calm. I'm calm all the time. And he really stresses me out, and I just... Rough morning. We really had a nice morning, if anything, but um, 
just, you know, work definitely through trying to get going and get a day going because you want to go, um, like, arches for the Yeah, I was yelling at him, and then when and you turned your lights on, I, like, kind of punched an arm, like, there's those. I, well, I was holding on to the keys because I just, I didn't want to go anywhere. And my big fear is, I don't have my phone, I don't really, I don't have a phone. So she goes off without me. You know, it's all right, I'm on my own. <laughs> Yeah, my, my heart rate, whenever the lights flash on, it, it gets your heart rate up. Yeah, do you know what she talks anything? She's just crazy. Did you hear that last line? She's just crazy. I mean, that's August 12th, Jim Murray, and we now know that it was about two weeks later that Gabby would be dead, and now they are investigating that incident. They're investigating how the police actually handled that incident out in Moab. I mean, it's very distressing when you see how his demeanor is and the fact that he's fine with the narrative that she's the aggressor. Well, and that's actually what the officer noted. The officer's report indicates that she was the aggressor, but the 911 operator reported that a witness saw him hitting her. And what that officer elected to do is to separate them for a night. You, you make an interesting point also, Ashley, that that volatility continued, we know, for two weeks because the last time they were seen together was actually the 27th at a restaurant, and there was another dramatic scene of volatility, her crying, him very angry. So this wasn't, this on-again, off-again drama continued, we know, for at least the te last two weeks of her life. So Mark O'Mara, that's not the only police investigation right now where the police are actually under the microscope. Um, we're now, you know, fielding a lot of criticism on what the Northport police did in effectively allowing him to get away. This was a man who was driving a missing woman's vehicle. This was a man whose parents said, we're not making him available to you. This was a man who refused to even, you know, offer the most banal of advice, which was uh, the last time I saw her was in Wyoming. And they didn't keep an eye on him. What does that tell you about the, what the police down there are going to face? Well, the problem with it is that, you know, in hindsight, it is obvious that Northport should have done more than they did. But we really have to look at it through the officer's eyes when they are understanding and investigating the situation. They do have somebody who's missing, you're right, and they do have him driving the van home. But he comes across pretty well. He has this slight charisma to him. Of course, she's the crazy one, right? So we don't know, and, and I'm just coming home. If we look back and say, how dare you let this guy go wander off into the ozone somewhere. But I, I have to say, not just to give officers cover, you know, I don't do that unless they deserve it. But I, what I see is that they didn't have enough information to do much more than do the investigation. What could they have done? Arrested him for something? No. Restrained him? You can't just do that in this country without probable cause. And there was no true evidence that a crime had been committed at that point. It's just sad that now we have a nation nationwide manhunt going on for somebody who literally they had in their hands. Right. It's so frustrating. You know, those officers out there may not have heard anything from what the witness said, which was he is hitting and slapping her. When they got out there, the couple said the opposite. And so what are they to believe? All right, I'm going to switch gears. When we come back after the break panel, um, there is that question. Where she was found is a crime scene, and it will factor heavily into any prosecution if we ever find the person who did this to her. But did she die where she was found? Coming up, an incredible theory arising out of the timeline from all of the social media, people who have seen where they were and spotted them on the timeline. It may just tell you what happened. That's next. I want to welcome back uh, our amazing panel of guests. Elizabeth Vargas is the host of America's Most Wanted. Steve Helling has the cover story on People magazine, and it is a cover you should buy because it highlights 
what happened between this couple, Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry, uh, well before the current situation that we find ourselves in now. Uh, Jim Murray is the chief correspondent for Inside Edition, and Mark O'Mara is a criminal defense attorney and a civil rights attorney. All right, to the four of you, every day we seem to get brand new information, um, but the pieces of the puzzle seem to really be coming, you know, obvious. Like we're getting a puzzle that's coming together. Um, some of the pieces seem really huge, others seem insignificant, but the police always say no detail is too small. And so it seems at this point that there's the laser focus that's coming down towards August the 27th. And I'll tell you why I think that. The final week of August is an incredible few days. I'm going to begin with August 25th. Gabby talks to her mother on FaceTime for the final time. She says she and Brian are on Grand Teton, okay, in the National Park in Wyoming. Following day, August 26th, at 8 p.m., a TikToker named Jessica Schultz says that she sees Brian trying to park that white van. It's at the Spread Creek Campground. Later that day, at 6 p.m., that's five hours later, a YouTuber named Red, White, and Bethune sees this. It's the van back at the same spot that it had been seen on the 26th. It's the Spread Creek Campground. The original TikToker who spotted the van, Jessica, says that she also remembers seeing the van again at that spot on that day, the 27th. And remember, it's the same day that Gabby's mother got that bizarre text from Gabby's phone. It read, can you help Stan? I just keep getting his voicemails and missed calls. Stan is Gabby's grandfather. And Gabby's mom says she never called him Stan. She called him Grandpa. The following day, August 28th, that original TikToker, Jessica Schultz, who first spotted the van in Spread Creek Campground, says she thinks she may have seen the, day on that day, the van on that day, too, but she can't be certain. The next day, August 29th, TikToker Miranda Baker says she picked up a hitchhiker. Looked a lot like Brian Laundrie. Take a look. But before he came in the car, he offered to pay us like $200 to give him a ride, like 10 miles. So that was kind of weird. Um, he then told us he's been camping for multiple days without his fiance. He did say he had a fiance and that she was working on their social media page back at their van. Um, then once like in conversation, I brought up, yep, like we're going to Jackson. Um, he freaked out. He's like, nope, I need to get out right now. Um, you know, like pull over. Miranda Baker says Brian was in her car from about 5.30 to 6.09 p.m. And two days after he apparently leaves Miranda, the white van is picked up by a license plates reader. It's in Northport, Florida now. The ride from Spread Creek Campground in Wyoming to Northport, Florida is about 35 hours. So if Brian got back to his van uh, in the Spread Creek Campground that night, that would have given him plenty of time, more than 60 hours to make the 35-hour drive. That's a lot of time to stop for gas, food, and have a nap along the way. Maybe even gave him time to send that bizarre text, the next text, to his mother. Strange text again from Gabby's phone on August 30th saying, no service in Yosemite. But we, of course, know that that's the National Park in California, where neither Gabby nor that van ever reached. So, Elizabeth Vargas, um, this is remarkable. In your line of work, again, America's Most Wanted, there is a brand new crime-fighting tool in the way of people and social media and their cell phones. And it very well may have pinpointed that that August 27th campground restaurant fight back to the campground empty van spotted. It's pretty remarkable. It is. And Ashley, you can bet that the FBI agents are pouring over all of this. And I mean, we don't know that all this is accurate. Some of this might conflict. I mean, was he alone or was he with Gabby the first time that white van is spotted? But they're pouring over all this. And all it takes, I mean, people now have, you know, cameras in their phone. Uh, and, and they have their phones with them at all times. And they can take these pictures um, and document things. And by the way, it also works the other way. Um, I'm sure the FBI agents are, have been pinging exactly where Gabby's phone was during the time in question, those crucial days that you just thoroughly outlined at the beginning of this segment. I mean, they're looking at all of this, but it, all it takes is one person who saw something. And to be honest, in this case in particular, we have a lot of people weighing in on social media who are van lifers themselves, who might be out in the park, who might not have seen some of the coverage, who might be traveling, that sort of thing, and not be in tune. 
Um, thankfully, now, as we've seen from these astronomical numbers on TikTok, people are tuning in on the road and weighing in with sightings that could prove incredibly invaluable in this investigation. Mark O'Mara, jump on that thought that Elizabeth just outlined, the fact that everybody's got a phone. And guess what? Everyone now has one of these. It's an Apple Watch, and everybody has an Alexa, and everybody has a brand new car with a GPS. They all have GPS locators in them, in case you didn't know. And everybody has something that gives a digital popcorn trail about all the secret things you've done. Do you think that's part and parcel of the Dozens of boxes that were being taken out of the laundry home, some of those digital devices that will betray people with secrets. Oh, absolutely. Phones, iPads, cell phones, black boxes in cars, like you mentioned. There's a lot of digital information that is out there and around us that's going to help, quote, solve this case or at least get some of those piece puzzles pieces of the puzzle put back together. There's an enormous amount of information that the FBI is gathering that we here tonight have no idea what they're doing, but we know that there are some focus that they have to it. And I'll give you a quick example. That move of getting the hitchhiking, getting picked up in the van and then getting back out of it, you know, we don't know that that could either be him fleeing the scene, that could actually be him setting up maybe an alibi, you know, Give somebody $200, they're going to remember you were in their van for a little while, find out they're going back to Jackson where you don't want to go. This is great speculation, but Ashley, you and I have talked about this so many times. We have to just take what we have, extrapolate a little bit, but not too much, and just wait until we get more evidence that's going to come from the FBI during their ongoing investigation and try and put it together when we have a few more of those pieces, because the, the, mm -hmm. the, the puzzle picture is just way too distorted right now. Yeah, I just jotted down a couple more. So I'm just going to go over the list of things that will come back to haunt you if you decide to do something bad. Cell phones, laptops, Alexa, Apple Watch, Ring.com, business and home surveillance, traffic cameras, toll cameras, license plate readers, GPS on the vehicles, cameras at the ATM, and the credit card or the bank card you swipe. All of these things can tell uh, police and investigators exactly what you've been up to, or in this particular case, what Brian Laundrie has been up to. When we come back after the break, Brian's parents, what a pair. Today was not a good day for them. Today they found out there's a federal arrest warrant for their son. Are they about to find out what their part in all of this might mean for them? And might it mean they need a really good lawyer? We're back after this. Welcome back to our special coverage of the Gabby Petito homicide investigation and the hunt for Brian Laundrie across the country. It is a federal arrest warrant he's now facing for bank fraud, but that means anybody across the country can collar that man if and when they see him. Still with me, my fantastic four guests, Elizabeth Vargas. She's the host of America's Most Wanted, so clearly has her eye on the Brian Laundrie fugitive case. Also with me, Steve Helling, who is a senior writer for People magazine. He's got the cover story. Jim Murray, chief correspondent for Inside Edition, and Mark O'Mara, who is a criminal and uh, a criminal defense attorney and a civil rights attorney. All right. So uh, fascinating, guys. The, the laundry parents were seen more today than we have seen them in about two weeks. Uh, they came out of the house. They got into the truck, and it appeared they were headed towards the Northport Police Station. We do not know if they ended up there, but this was a sight that we didn't expect to see. Eight o'clock in the morning, the two of them, without any luggage, just a purse, getting into the car and heading off. They came back, and they got the Mustang back, but then they jumped back in that vehicle, and they headed off to Orlando to meet their lawyer. Jim Murray, you are a lawyer. I wonder the kind of lawyer they are meeting with. Is it a criminal defense attorney? Is it a friend who's a lawyer who comes cheap? Is it somebody who's going to help them if there might be a civil case against them? But wouldn't you advise as an attorney that they get a really good criminal defense attorney? I would, and, and to be honest with you, it's these parents that are the hardest for me to wrap my head around. Look, we, we cover crime on a daily basis, but the parents here, let's, let's take a look at what happened. I have a son about Brian La uh, Laundrie's age. If he comes home after a long trip, his fiance's not with him, 
Where is she? You ask questions. Is she okay? Have you seen her? Have you talked to her? These parents didn't seem to do that. Ten days go by, she's finally declared missing, and then the son, for some inexplicable reason, decides to go on a hike the next day, and now he's missing, and it takes them a few days to even report that. They don't seem like parents who are very concerned about Gabby or for their own son, for that matter, which makes me wonder whether they think he's alive or dead. I, I suspect that, look, nobody's suggesting that they had anything to do with Gabby Petito's death, but they may very well know what happened to her based upon their conversations with their son, and I think they could be looking at some legal trouble here. Yeah, you can still get in a whole lot of trouble if you're involved. It's called after the fact. And uh, at this point, if they do anything to help their boy, they could be harboring a fugitive or helping him in some manner. And that comes with a hefty tag on a federal crime. So, Steve Helling, we're looking at all these officers in front of the laundry home, but there are so many more, 50 50 agencies yesterday, or 50 officers yesterday, or yesterday. Today, 75 different officers are searching for him in that swamp. And 16 agencies now, it, it comes to pass, that there are 16 agencies that are looking for him. I know that you've been down there. I suppose this is not surprising that it just keeps growing, the manhunt. No, it's not surprising at all. And the more that the longer that goes without any sort of answers for where he is, there's going to be more and more people getting involved in trying to look for him. I mean, everything about this, obviously the cases are very different, but Ashley, you and I both covered Casey Anthony, tw what, 12 years ago now, and a lot of these things seem very familiar. The crowds outside the home, the, the, the search warrants, the, the parents. Everything, you know, when these stories are big, when these cases are big, high profile cases, you end up having a lot of police officers involved. That's just the way it goes. Yeah, and there's that tip line, 1-800-CALL-FBI. I know it's nice to look at Steve Helling, but look below him, and now look below me, 1-800-FBI. If you're in one of those states, you might see something. Your ring cam might have seen something. We showed you the routes all the way from Wyoming to Florida. We showed you all the states. I'm going to read them after the break, and I'm going to ask this very important question. How is this going to end? That's next. If you live along any of these routes, these might have been the routes that Brian Laundrie took to get home from Grand Teton to Northport, Florida. If you live in the following states, check your ring.com, check your dash cams on your car. Wyoming, Nebraska, Missouri, Illinois, Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma. I got the perfect person to ask about this from America's Most Wanted. Elizabeth Vargas is with me. That is a lot of people along those routes who might be able to put in tips to your show, to the FBI. Elizabeth, you've been in this business a long time. How do you think this is going to end? I don't know, Ashley. I really don't know. I've covered so many stories. I covered a case where I was certain these two people had gone on the run and had vanished into thin air, and so did all the federal authorities. And two years later, they found their bodies in Narragansett Bay. And I've had the opposite happen. Like, long after we believed somebody was dead, they were found 10, 20 years later. We have found fugitives, uh, sometimes decades after they committed their crimes. You just never know. And I have to say, because you were just talking about Brian Laundrie's parents, you know, Gabby lived with them. And just two years ago, I interviewed Casey Anthony's parents. They are still, gra they will never recover from this, what happened. He believes that their daughter's a murderer. She's grasping at anything else but that possibility. They will never, they are in agony to this day. So whatever the laundry, you know, the laundries know about their son and what he may or may not have done, what they talk, I mean, for 10 days, like you said, where is she? She lives here. What do you mean you left her in Wyoming? Is she okay? All those conversations. This is going to haunt them for the rest of their lives. I'll bet. Mark O'Mara, you are no stranger to representing someone who was disliked across the country, George Zimmerman in the Trayvon Martin killing. Mm -hmm. Somebody, if Brian Laundrie is caught, is going to have to represent sure. him. What advice do you have for that attorney, Mark? So he's not in a swamp. 
Um, he's probably still alive. He is going to get caught eventually. He is going to be charged with probably a state crime. And, you know, he knows how she died, presumably. And he's got to fit his explanation for what happened into the forensic evidence of how she died. It's going to be a, we got into a fight, we tussled, she fell, whatever. And I took off because I was afraid you were going to hold me responsible for her death when it wasn't my fault. That's going to be the way this plays out under most percentage circumstances. They need a very good lawyer to be able to put all of that together, try explain away person who is now one of the most hated men in America, if you think about it because of what they, we all perceive he did to Gabby. Uh, and you're going to have to have a very good lawyer and a good team to, to change that sort of cruise ship around into a better position where he might get a fair trial if and when he's caught and if and when he's tried. There is word we should get autopsy results, in, uh, including the cause of death on Tuesday. That could certainly change the metric of this story. I want to thank all four of you, Elizabeth Vargas, Steve Helling, Jim Murray, Mark O'Mara, just brilliant insight into all of the possibilities. And I want to show the viewers one last thing, and that is this. It's the arrest warrant. Here it is, folks. It's the arrest warrant. But as we all know, a bank fraud charge, you can add to that. You can add to that all the time. And it wouldn't be a stretch if we heard about murder charges, given all the facts we know. But wait for it. Thanks for being with us for this special edition, everyone of Banfield. We'll see you tomorrow night right back here at 10 Eastern.